We're back to our series called The New Normal. We are looking at how we can deal with this situation called COVID-19 or when life throws you new normals. And I'm sure that some of you are facing new normals in your life. Things are different than what they once were. But the issue is how do you respond to those new normals? How, how do you deal uh, with it? Uh, we said keep moving. Keep moving. That's what we said first. And then we also agreed and we understood that we must be okay with God's way. Today I bring you the third installation. And it's coming from Jeremiah chapter 29 and verses 15 to 21. Jeremiah chapter 15. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 15 uh, to 21. If you can turn there in your passages. Today I have changed my preaching text. I'm using the English Standard Version of, of the Bible. I find that there are times in our lives that we are seeking a message from God. We want God to speak to us. And sometimes the message comes and we are not yet prepared for the message. We rather choose another message. And this is the issue that I find that the people are going through in Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 15. If you have your Bibles, Jeremiah chapter uh, 29, verse 15 to 21, the word of God says, beginning in verse 15, because you have said the Lord has raised up prophets for us in Babylon. Thus says the Lord, because you have said, thus says the Lord concerning the king who sits on the throne of David. And concerning all the people who dwell in this city, your kinsmen who did not go out with you into exile. Thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, I'm sending on them sword, famine, and pestilence. And I'll make them like vile figs that are so rotten that, can, they, they can, that cannot be eaten. Verse 18, I'll pursue them with sword, famine, and pestilence. And I'll make them a horror. To all the kingdoms of the earth, to be a curse, a terror, a hissing, and a reproach among all the nations where I have driven them. Notice this. Because, don't miss this, because they did not pay attention to my words, declares the Lord, that I persistently sent to you or to them by my servants, the prophets. But you would not listen, declares the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord, all you exiles who I sent away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, concerning Ahab, the son of Coliah, and Zedekiah, the son of Maaseiah, who are prophesying to you, who are prophesying a lie to you in my name. Behold, I will deliver them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall strike them before your eyes. He shall strike them down before your eyes. Verse 22. Because of them, Ahab and Zedekiah, this curse shall be used by all the exiles from Judah in Babylon. The Lord make you like Zedekiah and Ahab, who the king of Babylon roasted in the fire. Because they have done an outrageous thing in Israel, they have committed adultery with their neighbor's wives, they have spoken in my name lying words that I did not command them. And last but not the least, I am the one who knows, and I'm witness, declares the Lord. The message is simply tagged this morning, false prophets don't profit. I'd like you to repeat after me and, and say with me, false prophets don't profit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that you may speak to our hearts, that, Lord, you may ring true today and help us, Lord, to love you with everything that we have got and teach us your truth. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. <clears throat> false prophets don't a prophet. Allow me just to take care of a little technical difficulty here. False prophets don't profit. 
A school system had a program to help students who were admitted in the hospital. One day, a teacher that was assigned to go to the hospital received a call. She went to see the student's homeroom teacher and discussed the plan that she was supposed to present to the student or the lesson she was supposed to present to the student. And the teacher told this teacher that was assigned, said, we are learning nouns and adverbs. I would really appreciate it if you would go and teach him nouns and adverbs so that he's not behind with the rest of the class. So she got the room number, she got the address of the hospital, and she made her way to the hospital. When she got to the hospital, she was led to the room of this student. When she got into the room of the student, she wasn't aware that he was suffering third degree burns. To her, she had had a trauma or a situation in the past with third degree burns. And so when she entered the room, she was shocked and she was afraid. So she made her way to the bed and she introduced herself. She said, I am so and so. I've come from the school system and I'm here to help you keep pace with your class and so that you know what they are doing. The student laying on the bed with third degree burns did not respond to her. In fact, the whole time she was teaching the lesson, she was stammering. And when she left that day, she felt like she hadn't accomplished anything. She felt as if she was a, a failure. So she went home. The next day she had to come back because she was assigned for two weeks. So she came back. Now as she's entering the hospital room, her head is down and she's wondering, oh, here we go again. This is another one of those sessions I have to suffer again. And I don't know if it's the lessons are going to make an impact today. As she has her face down, uh, a nurse that was tending to the boy meets her and she says, what did you do? What did you do? And she says, uh, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I, 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 mean, I mean, what did you do to the boy? And she started to apologize. And, and there the nurse stopped her. She says, wait a minute. You know, your work yesterday really touched this boy's life because we thought he didn't want to live anymore. He wasn't responding to treatment. He wasn't responsive to anything that we're trying to do to him. But after you left him yesterday, he started to respond and things have changed. And it's as if he has decided to live. Later on, after two weeks, they asked the boy what had happened. What was the change that happened in him for him to move from wanting to die and wanting to live? And he put it this way. They wouldn't send a teacher to help a dying boy on a bed, would they? They wouldn't help a teacher to come into my situation and help me, would they? He was so surprised that somebody had come in his point of need. Somebody has come, had come in his situation, in his new normal, and had injected into his life hope. I believe that many of us, we are like this boy lying on a bed. We are in a new situation. We have been burnt by the situation. We are struggling and we are suffering. And the thing that we need the most at this particular moment is a message of hope. I would like to submit to you that when we are in a new normal, we crave or we thirst for a message of hope. We want somebody to come and, and speak to us the right words. And this is what I've discovered in this COVID-19, that many of us are are, are looking for a message to encourage us. We, we want to hear that things are going to get better. We want to hear that after a certain period of time, uh, we are, we are going to get our pay at the same level as it once was. Uh, we want to hear that at, at a certain time uh, that we're going to be able to go back to work. We are going to be able to go back on coffee day. We're going to be able to, to do the things that we normally do. 
We are waiting for the gates to be open at the airport. We are waiting for that opportunity to go and sunbathe on the beaches of Bali. And all of us in, 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 in this particular situation, in this COVID-19, we are seeking that message of hope. We are, we are looking for something to inspire us. And most of the times we, we go to people to inspire us. We, we read books to inspire us. We look for preachers to inspire us. In fact, the reason why I have a job and the reason why you listen to the sermons week after week is because you are thirsting for hope. Uh, you want this message that I'm sharing with you right now to inspire your mind, to inspire your, your outlook, to, to inject your motivation that you can live one more time, that you can take one more step, that one more day you can make it. And that's, that's how we are and that's what we want. And the exiles in Babylon that we read about in Jeremiah 29 they also thirst for hope. And they find and quench their thirst of hope by declaring in verse number 15, they say, because the Lord has raised up prophets. The Lord has raised up prophets for us. In other words, the Lord has given us people to speak to us. The Lord has given us people to inspire us. In fact, they were not wrong. You see, what I love about this declaration is that it was a scripturally, biblically, and, and truthfully based. Because according to Deuteronomy, and follow what I'm saying, Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 15, we read these words from Moses. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers, it is he whom you shall listen to. Uh, you see, God raised up certain folks to speak to his people. You see, God raised up folks from among them because, as you know, it is better to listen to somebody who understands us than to listen to somebody who doesn't understand us. So the prophets came from among them because they would experience their situation. Because they would be going through the same heartaches. And so they were able to speak to their situations. Uh, let me talk to all the tech gurus and all the, the geeks. You see, prophets were like servers. As you know that on, on WhatsApp we have end-to-end -end, uh, encryption. And end-to-end -end encryption is when, when you send a message to somebody else, somebody else gets the message and, and no one in between can can read the message the message before it gets to you is stored in a server prophets were servers that stored the message from God to the people and from the people to God and so God picked these people so that they could inspire the people so that they could give them a message of of hope uh, you see prophets are good because you know how it is that sometimes our relationship with God can become hard and difficult. Because, you know, you can pray to God sometimes. Lord, I need you to answer my prayer. And, and, and you're praying. But sometimes you don't get a response back. Uh, sometimes you, you don't hear a message in your, in your ears. But a prophet, a human person who delivers a message, like right now, you can hear that. You can understand that. And so these prophets were there. And I want to submit to you that uh, prophets possessed charisma. Prophets uh, uh, possessed influence. Prophets were the go-to people. When you needed an answer, you went to a prophet. And so for the people of God in Babylon to say, the Lord has raised up for us prophets, it was like God is with us. God is on our side. God is going to look after us. Today, I believe that prophets take the pulpit. Today, I believe that prophets write self-help books. Today, I believe prophets host talk shows and they have podcasts. Today, I believe prophets serve as mentors. Today, I believe prophets act in movies, score baskets, and hit tennis balls. You see, a prophet 
is any person who influences your thinking, who influences your believing, who influences your living, who influences your loving, who influences your hating, who influences your motivating, any person in your life that's such an influence, any person in your life that you listen to, that is a prophet for you. Amen. You see, these prophets, these prophets that had been raised up in Babylon, they preached a short stay in Babylon. But Jeremiah, the prophet that God had raised up, preached a long stay in Babylon. In other words, God said A through Jeremiah. Jeremiah. They said B. And here we have a contra contradiction. They are saying one thing. They are talking one story. Jeremiah is talking another story. And I want you to catch this fundamental concept that I want to bring to you this morning. You see, often the vulnerable suffer from denials of dreams. And because they suffer from denial of dreams, they quench their denial on promises manufactured by human plots. Allow me to just make it simple. Because there was a problem with their, their, their there was a problem with the message of God. God is saying you're going to stay long in Babylon. Because there was a message that was wrong with that. They were in denial. And so they sought prophets who were going to speak to their situation. Let me bring it closer to you. A lot of times when we are in a situation that we do not understand. When we're in a, in a place that we do not like. We will try to find a message that is going to tell us that, that everything is going to be okay. A message that's going to speak to us contrary uh, to what we feel or what is on the ground. And so because of these prophets spoke to their egos, because these prophets spoke to their plans, they were uh, claiming these are the prophets that God has sent for us. Brother and sister, I want to declare, do not allow your moment of weakness to make you drink or quench your thirst from a wrong source. Do not allow your moment of weakness to make you run to prophets that haven't been sent by God. But prophets that you have claimed have been sent by God. And Lord knows that many of us, we sometimes listen to the wrong voices. Sometimes we listen to the wrong preachers. Sometimes we listen to the wrong sermons. Sometimes we read the wrong books. Sometimes we read the wrong movies. Sometimes we listen to the wrong songs. And because we listen to the wrong messages, we drink in that message. It changes how we see a situation. And instead of us embracing the situation that God has intended, in, instead of us embracing the vision of God, we end up saying no to the vision of God. And we choose the vision that we have created. Allow me to declare, yes, it is good to drink and quench your thirst for motivation and for hope and, and your dreams. But it is important. It is important that you drink from the source that God has created. You drink from the fountain that God has created. You see the people were saying. God has raised up prophets. But Jeremiah counteracts what God says. If you read the passage again. Seven times Jeremiah will say, thus saith the Lord, or declares the Lord. It's like they are saying their message. They are preaching their truth. But God says, listen, that, that's your truth. That's your belief. That's your understanding. But let me tell you how I see things. Listen to me. The difference between your truth and the truth of God is the difference between what Jokowi says and what you say. The message of God has a, higher, has a higher authority than your message. And so Jeremiah says, listen, I know that you're saying that God has sent his prophets. But let me tell you what God is saying. And so seven times we are told, uh, the, 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 the people are told that do not listen uh, to what these guys are saying. But listen to what I have to tell you. You see, Jeremiah breaks it down, and I, I, wanna, I want you to get what Jeremiah says. 
Jeremiah says, look, because you say that God has raised up prophets, I'm going to send on you the trifecta, the trifecta, get the trifecta. I'm going to send on you sword, famine, and pestilence. Basically, it's going to be a loss of life. It's going to be a loss of health. And it's going to be a loss of, of food. Because you have listened to these prophets. And so what, what God does is he, he, pu he pulls back the curtain. Because the prophets were saying, you're going to stay here for a short time in Babylon. We're going to go back to Judah and Jerusalem. So God says, okay, let me show you what's really going to happen in Judah and, and Jerusalem. So he said, I'm going to send the trifecta on you. And, and just for you to understand what the trifecta really looked like. Here's what the writer of Lamentation says in, in verse, uh, in chapter 4, in chapter 2, verse 20. This is what he says. Check this. Look, O Lord, and see with whom you have dealt thus. Should women eat the fruit of their womb, the children of their tender care? Should priest and prophet be killed in the sanctuary? In, in, in short, when you read these words, it, it almost makes you puke. Can you imagine a mother killing her own baby to eat? Can you imagine a prophet and a preacher in church preaching a message of God, but he gets shot? But this was because of the trifecta that God sent on the people. And here is, is, is the situation. God says in verse number seven, here says the Lord of hosts, God became what I call a warrior. God became a fighter. And when you read the expression, the Lord of hosts, it means that God has decided to fight. God has decided to get involved in the battle. God has decided to engage in war. And God is not fighting the Babylonians. He's not fighting the Egyptians. He is fighting his own people. He has turned his attention to his own people because his own people don't want to listen to his word. They are listening to another man's word who says I'm a prophet of God. And in verse 19, God says, I have sent the trifecta. I've sent these things because you don't pay attention to my words. You don't listen to what I have to say. You don't follow what I have to say. You see, there are people in life that I believe you should never make your enemy. Follow what I'm saying. You should never make your teacher an enemy. You should never make the police officer an enemy. You should never make your boss an enemy. Why? Because if you make them your enemy, they're going to use their power against you. And here the people of God have made God their enemy because rather than listening to what he is saying through his prophet that he has raised up in Jeremiah, they're listening to what others are saying. You see, my friend, you got to catch what I'm saying. We should not listen to another message because when we listen to another message that hasn't been sent by God, we are putting ourselves in a situation where God has to turn his attention on us. And God knows I'm talking to people that sometimes God has had to turn the situation in your life because you haven't been paying attention to his word. God has been preaching to you. God has been speaking to you. And you know how it is sometimes. You feel it. You know you got to quit that job. You know that you got to quit that relationship. You know that you got to quit that habit. You know that you got to start doing something. And, and, and the message is clear. But what you hear is not how you feel it. How, what you hear is not what you want. And so a lot of times we choose to go our own way. And we claim, yeah, God is speaking to me. God is on my side. Yeah, God is saying I'm not speaking. And therefore when it doesn't work out. When it's not going well as it should, and then we start to say, no, how can God be so mean? No, God is not mean. You just don't have a mind to listen to what he's saying. You just don't have a heart to do what he says. And so here God has to tell his people, look, I'm not going to allow you to slight me. I'm not going to allow you to fight me. I'm going to fight back and show you that, look, if you don't listen to what I got to say, there is trouble coming your way. You see, there are times I find that the word of God pricks at us, right? The word of God is like salt. It, uh, how can I put it? It, it adds injury. It, 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 makes us, it makes us not feel good. Sometimes you listen to me preach or another pastor preach and you're like, ouch. And you, 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 your toe is like, ouch. And, and we're like, man, that's not good. And sometimes we try to brush it off. We, we look for what I call spiritual sweetness. Spiritual sweetness is to get that message that, you know, only talks you up. You know, it only lifts you up. 
You know what I mean? But there's something that you know about sugar and that is dangerous and that sugar creates diabetes. Could it be that we have spiritual di di diabetics in the church because they are so interested in listening to a message that suits them? Right? But yet when God sends a message to amputate their pride, to amputate their selfishness, to amputate their, their love for self, to amputate their bad habits, they're like, no, I don't want that. And these prophets, who the people were saying have been raised up, they were uh, giving people spiritual sweetness. But God is saying, look, if you, don't, if you don't listen to what Jeremiah the prophet I have raised up, then you are in trouble of suffering. And here's something funny. God had raised up a prophet in Jeremiah and he was preaching the message of God consistently all the time telling them, look, if you don't turn away from Babylon, from your wicked ways, Babylon is coming and they're going to destroy you. And sure enough, Nebuchadnezzar came and took the people into captivity. Now Jeremiah sends a message to the people in captivity saying, look, don't fight God. Chill out. Relax. Just settle down in Babylon, it's going to be okay. But yet they're saying, no, we're going to go back uh, to God. Isn't it funny that sometimes we, we, we want God to speak to us, right? God, I want a message from you. I want you to, 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 to tell me what's going on. But then when the message comes, we're like, uh, God, you know what? Um, uh, it's, uh, yeah, I don't think that's what I need right now. You, you know what I mean? I think I'm not ready yet. And we make excuses, right? We are like, uh, I, I still need to grow. I don't understand it yet. We go to the pastor with questions that we already know. You know what I mean? Pastor, what do you think about this and this? And I'm like, what do you think about it? God has sent prophets. But instead of listening to the prophets that God had raised, Jeremiah, who was preaching a consistent message, and they said, no, we want our own prophets. So my brother and my sister, hear me carefully. Yes, you need to quench your, your thirst of hope. But make sure that it comes from the fountain that God has envisioned, that God has planned and purpose for your life. And here is the thing, though. And I know that you're probably thinking in your mind now. You're like, Lord, you know what? I, I, want, um, I want to listen to your message. I want to drink from your fountain. The question is, how do I actually do that? The question is, how do I drink from your fountain and enjoy the blessings of God? And here Jeremiah tells the people. In verse number 20, listen to this. This is what he says. Hear the word of the Lord, all you exiles whom I have sent to Jerusalem, to Babylon. Hear the word of the Lord. This is what Jeremiah says. You see, God calls them uh, to retune their message source. Don't miss that. God calls them to change the channel. God tells them, you are listening to the wrong message. Therefore, let me put you in the right, in the right framework. You need to hear what the Lord says. Now, now, you see, to hear what the Lord says is not only to listen to what God says, but it is also to do what God says. So when I was younger, when I was younger, when I was younger, I used to love to play Xbox. Now, when I was playing Xbox, I was there, you know, glued to the TV and whether I'm playing NBA Live or Madden, NFL Madden, or I'm playing NCAA, you know, football, and I, I, I'm just there hooked up. And so when people speak to me while I'm playing, I'm like, Henry, huh? Uh-huh. Uh, you you want to go out? Uh-huh. Uh, Henry, uh, can, you, can you hook me up later? Uh-huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh-huh, uh-huh. It's like the, the message was going in one ear and was coming out in the other ear. But I have a mother, my good old mother. She always persisted. And especially when I was playing Xbox, she would always persist. Henry, um, have you done it? Uh, Mom, I'm going to get to it. And she'll come back again. Henry, have you done it? Uh, I, I'll do it, Ma. Stop it. I'm like, ah, oh, gosh, Ma, come on. Then she'll come again to the point that I'll drop the, 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 the stick and, and then I'll go and do what she's telling me to do. Because my mother wanted to make sure that I not only heard what she said, but she wanted to make sure that I did what she said. You see, many of us, we hear what God says. The message comes, but we tune it out. And so here Jeremiah says, if you want to drink from the well that I've, I've, I've prepared, if you want to get the right message, you need to make sure that you tune into the right 
prophet. And you need to make sure that you tune out the wrong prophet. And so here he says, look, hear the word of the Lord. It's not time to study. It's not time to, go to call up a forum. It's just time to do it. As you listen to me preach right now, you, the, the word of God is, is going into your system. You're, you're hearing something come into, into your heart. It's not time to rationalize and, and to debate. It's time to simply say, you know what, Lord? You have spoken to me. I'm going to do what you say. Some of us, we study too much. We theorize too much. And we never get to the place of actually doing what we said. And I'm talking to some people who have always said, you know, I'm going to pray when I understand prayer. And yet you're still trying to understand prayer and you don't pray. I'm going to read the Bible more every day. You know, the pastor keeps telling me I need to read the Bible every day. But you are still telling yourself, I'm going to read the Bible every day. There has to come a point where you say, you know what? I'm going to do what you say. No matter what, I may not understand it, but I'm going to do it. Here is a little tip I want to throw at you. You get better as you do it. You don't have to wait until you have dotted all your T's, until you have crossed all your, I, your, your T's and dotted all your I's. Start with what you know and move up from there. Start with the little truth that you know. The little itty bitty truth and run with that. And the more you run with that, guess what happens? You increase your spiritual endurance. You strengthen your spiritual muscles and you grow higher with God. It is not time to debate. It is time to do what God says. I wish I had a witness in this place this morning. So you see what God does in in trying to help the people to do what he says is that he presents a case of two men the one man the one man is ahab and the other man is zedekiah ahab is is very interesting the name means god is a close relative and zedekiah means god is righteous but what is interesting about these two men and this is what god says about these two men he says that they are prophesying a lie to you in my name these two men are not living for me. These two men are not preaching for me. They are preaching for themselves. They are misrepresenting me. In fact, what Ahab and Zedekiah said, very interesting. This is what they said. They will tell people, you know what? It's okay to do what you feel. If, if you feel like you should do it, it's all right. And this is exactly what they said. Look at uh, Jeremiah 23 verse, 20, uh, 23, verse 27. This is what they said. They continually say to those who despise me, the Lord has said you shall have peace. And everyone who walks according to the dictates of his heart, no evil shall come upon you. In other words, you can do whatever you want. You see, these guys misrepresented God because they never presented the right picture of God. They're those people in your life that are in your life, but they never represent God correctly. When you're with them, you don't get better, you get worse. When you're with them, they make you do things that you never thought you would do. They make you go down paths that you shouldn't go. And these are the people that you need to get out of your, of your life. I consider these as a false prophets who don't profit. Because they are simply in your life because, well, they realize if I'm in your life, then I'm going to benefit from your life. And here's what I need you to understand. You see, these false prophets, they loved the opportunity to minister to people in Babylon because they realized, wait a minute, here in Babylon, people need hope. Right? The only way they, they, they're going to be hopeful is we tell them a good, sweet message that is telling them they're going to go back to uh, Jerusalem real quick. And because they were preaching that message, the people are saying, yeah, these are the guys that God has raised up. And so these kind of people that are in your life that only speak to you the message that you want to hear, they always flatter you. You know, there are some people who change based upon the ambience of a place, a person, or a position. When they come into a situation, they, they become like chameleons. They, 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 they adapt their colors. They adapt their movements. They adapt their speech. <laughs> I don't know if I'm talking to somebody. And these prophets capitalize on that because if they preached a good message, the people paid them for the message that they preached. So it was actually a financial profitable business to tell people the wrong message.
And so if you have people in your life that don't make you get better, but rather make you get worse, those I consider false prophets because they're not helping you level up. And those are the people that you need to let go. Yes, learn to tune these people out of your life because they're misrepresenting God in your life. There's something else I need to tell you about Ahab and Zedekiah. You see, Ahab and Zedekiah, they, they had committed a crime. Uh, in fact, the text says an outrageous crime. What they did was they slept with other men's wives and they were preaching lies that God is going to end the Babylonian captivity quickly. In other words, what they did was they did their ministry for personal benefit and personal gain. Can you imagine? They destroyed people's homes and they destroyed families and things just didn't work out. They just destroyed people's lives. But they did it because they were getting pleasure out of the situation. Uh huh. There are some people that are going to see you go down. But because you go down, they get lifted up. Because you go down, they gain from the situation. They're not going to tell you that you're about to make a mistake. They're going to still try to act like they are benefiting your life when they are not. And so these are the people that you need to tune out of your life. You see, when you have accepted the wrong message from God and you believe the message and it starts to change the way you behave, the way you act, it changes your standards, you lower them, then you know that you have accepted a false prophet. In fact, I would say that you yourself have become a, pros- a false prophet because you are not following the will and the purpose of God. But the question comes, Pastor, how do I know a false prophet? How do I know when a prophet is not really, you know, the right kind of prophet? You see, a false prophet speaks contrary to the will of God. Let me put it another way. A false prophet will contradict old revelation for new revelation. You see, the prophets of Jeremiah, the prophets in Jeremiah's time in Babylon, they were saying this is not going to last long. Yet the revelation that God had given was that this is going to last for 70 years. But rather than sticking to the 70 years revelation, the prophets gave a two-year revelation. And so you know that somebody is a false prophet if their message contradicts what the word of God says. If their message makes you say, you know what, hey, listen, uh, I read the Bible and everything. I study the Bible and everything. But the thing that you are telling me, I don't see that it is true. So when you see that situation, in fact, even when you're listening to somebody like me preach, you need to ask yourself questions. Is this person really preaching the right message? Is this person really telling me what the word of God is saying? And the only way you check that is if you, you, you understand old revelation. And some of us, we let go of old revelation for new revelation. You have always known that the Sabbath is Sabbath. Stick to that. You've always known that, you know, when the dead die, they don't go anywhere else. They stay in the grave. You stick to that. You've always known that Jesus Christ is coming back and everybody's going to see him audibly and visibly. You stick to that. You've always known that if you give to the Lord uh, a tenth of your income, you're going to be blessed. Stick to that. Stick to the old revelation because old revelation doesn't change. Old revelation simply gets amplified. You see, Jeremiah didn't change the message. He amplified the message. He didn't tell the exiles in Babylon, God is going to change his... No, he he didn't say that. He said, God is going to be with you in Babylon. God hasn't left you in Babylon. And I want somebody here to know that God hasn't left you. God is with you. Stick to the word that God has been given you. Stick to what he has always told you. Don't try to accept something new, something that is colorful, something that you like. You need to stick to what God has been telling you. Don't accept new revelation in place of old revelation. Rather accept new revelation that amplifies, that strengthens old revelation. I have a question for you this afternoon. Are you going to follow the prophets of God or are you going to follow false prophets that don't profit? You see, I see a picture of Jeremiah and I see him relating to Jesus Christ. Allow me to put it to you like this. Jeremiah, the name means raised up by God. 
Jeremiah was raised up by God to preach a message of God in a situation that was hostile, in an environment that didn't accept him, to people that rejected him. Jesus Christ lived in an environment that wasn't, wasn't conducive as well. It was, it was hostile to him as well. People didn't accept his message. He walked place to place and the prophets and the, no, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were far, you see, and they were sad, you see. They didn't like the message of Jesus, and so they turned him away, just like Jeremiah. You see, the prophet Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet, and Jesus is called as the man of sorrows because these two men, they wept over their people. They cried out to God and said, God, do something for these people. But the people rejected him. And could it be that today Jesus Christ is weeping for you because... You haven't been listening to his message. Rather, you've been listening to, to false prophets who don't profit. But today I want to say, God is calling you and I to follow Jesus Christ, the true prophet that has been raised. The true prophet that has, our, has, uh, has his best, uh, he has, he's thinking the best for us. The true prophet that wants to change our situation and make us better. Are you going to say, you know what, Lord? I want to accept the prophet Jesus. I want to follow him. I want to listen to his word. I want to go to the places that he has envisioned for me. Will you with me and say, you know what? I don't want to listen to false prophets that are own prophet. I want to follow the true prophet, Jesus, that prophets. That's my prayer today. And I hope it is your prayer too. May we... Follow the true prophet that prophets Jesus and leave away the false prophets that don't profit. The Ahabs and Zedekiahs, these people that are no good for us. And today accept Jesus Christ, the false prophet, the true prophet that prophets. Because when you accept the true prophet that prophets, then you're going to profit out of this new normal. This situation is going to be a blessing and you're going to make it through. This is my prayer. This is my hope, and I trust that it can be our hope and experience in Jesus. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you. Speak to our hearts. Strengthen us, Lord. We want to avoid false prophets that don't profit, but we want true prophets that profit. Father, we thank you. We appreciate you. In the awesome and wonderful name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.